All right, this is chapter three of Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. Uh, it's called Persons of Mean and Vile Condition. Uh, it's about Bacon's Rebellion and a series of rebellions that led up to the American Civil War. Uh, to quote Howard Zinn, in 1676, 70 years after Virginia was founded, 100 years before it supplied leadership for the American Revolution, that colony faced a rebellion of white frontiersmen, joined by slaves and servants, a rebellion so threatening that the governor had to flee the burning capital of Jamestown, and England decided to send a thousand soldiers across the Atlantic, hoping to maintain order among 40,000 colonists. This was Bacon's rebellion. After the uprising was suppressed, its leader, Nathaniel Bacon, dead, and his associates hanged, Bacon was described in a Royal Commission report. He was said to be about four or five and thirty years of age, indifferent, tall, but slender, black-haired, and of an ominous, pensive, melancholy aspect, of a pestilent and prevalent logical discourse tending to atheism. He seduced the vulgar and most ignorant people to believe two-thirds of each county being of that sort, so that their whole hearts and hopes were set now upon Bacon. Next, he charges the governor as negligent and wicked, treacherous and incapable, the laws and taxes as unjust and oppressive, and cries up uh, absolute necessity of redress. Thus Bacon encouraged the tumult, and as the unquiet crowd follow and adhere to him, he listeth them as they come in upon a large paper, writing their names circular-wise, that their ringleaders might not be found out. Having con conjured them into this circle, given them brandy to wind, them, wind up their charm, and enjoyed them by an oath to stick fast together and to him, and the oath being administered, he went and infected New Kent County ripe for rebellion. Um, whites who had been ignored when huge land grants around Jamestown were given away had gone west to find land, and there they encountered Indians. Were those frontier Virginians resentful that the politicos and landed aristocrats who controlled the colony's government in Jamestown first pushed them westward into Indian territory and then seemed indecisive in fighting the Indians? That might explain the character of their rebellion, not easily classifiable as either anti-aristocratic or anti-Indian, because it was both. So this is the nature of Bacon's Rebellion. It is a, a anti-Native American rebellion. Um, brought, brought on by um, the poor having been forced westward and not being protected uh, by those in the aristocracy uh, or in government um, and lended no protections. Um, so um, kind of questionable roots of, of Bacon's Rebellion. Um, maybe a, a, a different history than most people know. Um, in New England at this very time, Massot's son, Medicom, was threatening to unite Indian tribes, these are the Indian leaders, and had done frightening damage to Puritan settlements in King Philip's War. Violence had escalated on the frontier before the rebellion. Some Dogue Indians took a few hogs to redress a debt, and whites, retrieving the hogs, murdered two Indians. The Dogues then sent out a war party to kill a white herdsman, after which a white militia company killed 24 Indians. This led to a series of Indian raids, with the Indians outnumbered, turning to guerrilla warfare. The House of Burgesses in Jamestown declared war on the Indians, but proposed to exempt those Indians who cooperated. This seemed to anger the frontiers people, who wanted total war, but also resented the high taxes assessed to pay for the war. It was a dry summer, ruining the corn crop, which was needed for food, and the tobacco crop, needed for export. Governor Berkeley, in his 70s, tired of holding office, wrote wearily about his situation, quote, How miserable that man is that governs a people where six parts of seven at least are poor, indebted, discontented, and armed. His phrase, six parts of seven, suggests the existence of an upper class not so impoverished. In fact, there was such a class already developed in Virginia. Bacon himself came from this class, had a good bit of land, and was probably more enthusiastic about killing Indians than about redressing the grievances of the poor. But he became a symbol of mass resentment against the Virginia establishment and was elected in the spring of 1676 to the House of Burgesses. When he insisted on organizing armed detachments to fight the Indians, outside official control, Berkeley proclaimed him a rebel and had him captured, whereupon 2,000 Virginians marched into Jamestown to support him. Berkeley let Bacon go in return for an apology, but Bacon went off, gathered his militia, and began raiding the Indians. Bacon's Declaration of the People in July 1676 shows a mixture of populist resentment against the rich and frontier hatred of the Indians. 
It indicted the Berkeley administration for unjust taxes, for putting favorites in high positions, for monopolizing the beaver trade, and for not protecting the western farmers from the Indians. Then Bacon went out to attack the friendly Pamumki Indians, killing eight, taking others prisoner, plundering their possessions. There is evidence that the rank and file of both Bacon's rebellion army and Berkeley's official army were not as enthusiastic as their leaders. There were mass desertions on both sides, according to Washburn. In the fall, Bacon, aged 29, fell sick and died because of, as a contemporary put it, quote, swarms of vermin that bred in his body, unquote. A minister, apparently not a sympathizer, wrote this epitaph. Bacon is dead. I am sorry at my heart that lice and flux should take the hangman's part. The rebellion didn't last long after that. A ship armed with 30 guns cruising the York River became the base for securing order, and its captain, Thomas Grantham, used force and deception to disarm the last rebel forces. Coming upon the chief garrison of the rebellion, he found 400 armed Englishmen and Negroes, a mixture of free men, servants, and slaves. He promised to pardon everyone, to give freedom to slaves and servants, whereupon they surrendered their arms and dispersed, except for 80 Negroes and 20 English who insisted on keeping their arms. Grantham promised to take them to a garrison down the river, but when they got into the boat, he trained his big guns on them, disarmed them, and eventually delivered the slaves and servants to their masters. The remaining garrisons were overcome by one by one. Twenty-three rebel leaders were hanged. That's the end of Bacon's Rebellion. Another member of the governor's council, Richard Lee, noted that Bacon's rebellion had started over Indian policy, but the, quote, zealous inclination of the multitude, unquote, to support Bacon was due, he said, to, quote, hopes of leveling, unquote. Um, so Bacon's rebellion was about anti-Native American sentiment. Uh, the support for Bacon's rebellion was due to uh, hopes of, uh, to decrease, um, financial disparity. The servants who joined Bacon's Rebellion were part of a large underclass of miserably poor whites who came to the North American colonies from European cities whose governments were anxious to be rid of them. In England, the development of commerce and capitalism in the 1500s and 1600s, the enclosing of land for the production of wool, filled the cities with vagrant poor, and from the reign of Elizabeth on, laws were passed to punish them, imprison them in workhouses, or exile them. The Elizabethan definition of, quote, rogues and vagabonds, unquote, included. All persons calling themselves scholars going about begging, all seafaring men pretending losses of their ships, or goods on the sea going about the country begging, all idle persons going about in any country either begging or using any subtle craft or unlawful games, common players of interludes and minstrels wandering abroad, all wandering persons and common laborers being persons able in body, using loitering and refusing to work for such reasonable wages as tax or commonly given. So, the poor punished for their own unemployment uh, in, in Europe. So, uh, many were willing to sell themselves into the indentured servitude to make their way in the new world. Such persons found begging could be stripped to the waist and whipped bloody, could be sent out of the city, sent to workhouses, or transported out of the country. In the 1600s and 1700s, by forced exile, by lures, promises, and lies, by kidnapping, by their urgent need to escape the living conditions of the home country, poor people wanting to go to America became commodities of profit for merchants, traders, ship captains, and eventually their masters in America. Abbott Smith, in his study of indentured servitude, colonists in bondage, writes, quote, From the complex pattern of forces producing emigration to the American colonies, one stands out clearly as most powerful in causing the movement of servants. This was the pecuniary profit to be made by shipping them. After signing the indenture in which the immigrants agreed to pay their cost of passage by working for a master for five or seven years, they were often imprisoned until the ship sailed to make sure they did not run away. So, the primary reason for these people going over is because it was just so profitable. Uh, so much so that they're like, once once they made the decision, they made sure they didn't run away because it was just so lucrative. So, um, the Maryland court records show many ser servant suicides. In 1671, Governor Berkeley of Virginia reported that in previous years, four or five servants died of disease after their arrival. Many were poor children. 
gathered up by the hundreds on the streets of English cities and sent to Virginia to, to work. The master tried to control completely the sexual lives of the servants. It was in his economic interest to keep women servants from marrying or from having sexual relations because childbearing would interfere with work. Benjamin Franklin, writing as Poor Richard in 1736, gave advice to his readers, quote, Let thy maidservants be faithful, strong, and homely, unquote. Servants did not participate in juries, masters did, and being propertyless, servants did not vote. Gloucester County, servants again planned a general uprising. One of them gave the plot away and four were executed. The informer was given his freedom and 5,000 pounds of tobacco. Despite the rarity of servants' rebellions, the threat was always there and masters were fearful. Agreements among the colonies provided for the extradition of fugitive servants. These became the basis for the clause in the U.S. Constitution that persons, quote, held to service or labor in one state, escaping into another, shall be delivered up, unquote. One Maryland master complained to the provincial court in 1663 that his servants did, quote, peremptorily and positively refuse to go and do their ordinary labor, unquote. The servants responded that they were fed only beans and bread, and they were so weak we are not able to perform the employments he puts, up, puts us upon. They were given 30 lashes by the court. More than half the colonists who came to North America to, to the North American shores in the colonial period came as servants. Half the colonists. They were mostly English in the 17th century, Irish and German in the 18th century. More and more slaves replaced them as they ran away to freedom or finished their time. But as late as 1755, white servants made up 10% of the population of Maryland. What happened to these servants after they became free? There are cheerful accounts in which they rise to prosperity, becoming landowners and important figures. But Abbott Smith, after a careful study, concludes that colonial society, quote, was not democratic and certainly not e egalitarian. It was dominated by men who had money enough to make others work for them, unquote. And, quote, few of these men were descended from indentured servants and practically none had themselves been of that class, unquote. After we make our way through Abbott Smith's disdain for the servants as, quote, men and women who were dirty and lazy, rough, ignorant, lewd, and often criminal, unquote, who, quote, thieved and wandered, had bastard children and corrupted society with loathsome diseases, unquote, we find that, quote, about one in ten was a sound and solid individual who would, if fortunate, survive his seasoning, work out his time, take up land, and wax decently prosperous, unquote. Perhaps another one in ten would become an artisan or an overseer. The rest, 80%, who were, quote, certainly shiftless, hopeless, ruined individuals, either died during their servitude, returned to England after it was over, or became poor whites. The first batches of servants became landowners and politically active in the colony, but by the second half of the century, more than half the servants, even after 10 years of freedom, remained landless. Servants became tenants, providing cheap labor for the large planters both during and after their servitude. It seems quite clear that class lines hardened through the colonial period. The distinction between rich and poor became sharper. By 1700, there were 50 rich families in Virginia, with wealth equivalent to 50,000 pounds, a huge sum those days. Who lived, off their labor, who lived off the labor of black slaves and white servants, owned the plantations, sat on the governor's council, served as local magistrates. In Maryland, the settlers were ruled by a proprietor whose right of total control over the colony had been granted by the English king. Between 1650 and 1689, there were five revolts against the proprietor. In the Carolinas, the fundamental constitutions were written in the 1660s by John Locke, who was often considered the philosophical father of the founding fathers. And, uh, and the American system. Locke's constitution set up a feudal-type aristocracy in which eight barons would own 40% of the colony's land and only a baron would be governor. When the crown took direct control of North Carolina after a rebellion against the land arrangements, rich speculators seized, seized half a million acres for themselves, monopolizing the good farming land near the coast. Poor people, desperate for land, squatted on bits of farmland and fought all through the pre-revolutionary period against the landlord's attempt to collect rent. Carl Brittenbaugh's study of colonial cities, cities in the wilderness, reveals a clear-cut class system. He finds, The leaders of early Boston were gentlemen of considerable wealth who, in association with the clergy, eagerly sought to preserve in, American, in America the social arrangements of the mother country. By means of their control of trade and commerce, 
by their political domination of the inhabitants through church and town meeting, and by careful marriage alliances among themselves, members of this little oligarchy laid the foundations for an aristocratic class in 17th century Boston. At the very start of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630, the governor, John Winthrop, had declared the philosophy of the rulers, quote, In all times some must be rich, some poor, some high and eminent in power and dignity, others mean and in, in subjection, unquote. Rich merchants erected mansions, persons of quality traveled in coaches or sedan chairs, had their portraits painted, wore periwigs and filled themselves with rich food and Madeira, a petition came from the town of Deerfield in 1678 to the Massachusetts General Court, quote, You may be pleased to know that the very principal and best of the land, the best for soil, the best for situation, as laying in ye center and middle of the town, and as to quantity, near half, belongs unto eight or nine proprietors. In Newport, Rhode Island, Brittenbaugh found, as in Boston, that, quote, the town meetings, while ostensibly democratic, were in reality controlled year after year by the same group of merchant aristocrats who secured most of the important offices, unquote. The New York aristocracy was the most ostentatious of all. Brittenbaugh tells of, quote, window hangings of camlet, Japan tables, gold-framed looking glasses, spinets and massive eight-day clocks, richly carved furniture, jewels and silver plate, black house servants, unquote. New York in the colonial period was like a feudal kingdom. The Dutch had set up a patroonship system along the Hudson River with enormous landed estates where the barons controlled completely the lives of their tenants. In 1689, many of the grievances of the poor were mixed up in the farmer's revolt of Jacob Leisler and his group. Leisler was hanged and the parceling out of huge estates continued. Under Governor Benjamin Fletcher, three-fourths of the land in New York was granted to about 30 people. In 1700, New York City church wardens had asked for funds from the Common Council because, quote, the cries of the poor and impotent for want of relief are extremely grievous, unquote. In the 1730s, demand began to grow for institutions to contain, quote, the many beggarly people daily suffered to wander about the streets, unquote. A city council resolution read, Whereas the necessity, number, and continual increase of the poor within the city is very great and frequently commit uh, divers, diverse misdemeanors within the said city, who living idly and unemployed become debauched and instructed in the practice of thievery and debauchery, for remedy whereof resolve that there be forthwith built a good, strong, and convenient house of, and tenement. The two-story brick structure was called, quote, poorhouse, workhouse, and house of correction, unquote. A letter to Peter Zanger's New York Journal in 1737 described the poor street urchin of New York as, quote, an object in human shape, half starved with cold, with clothes out of the elbows, out at the elbows, knees through the breeches, hair standing on end. From the age about four to 14, they spend their days in the streets. Then they are put out as apprentices, perhaps four, five, or six years, unquote. The colonies grew fast in the 1700s. English settlers were joined by Scotch-Irish and German Im immigrants. Black slaves were pouring in. They were 8% of the population in 1690, 21% in 1770. The population of the colonies was 250,000 in 1700, 1,600,000 by 1760. Agriculture, oop, through all that growth, the upper class was getting most of the benefits and monopolized political power. A historian who studied Boston tax lists in 1687 and 1771 found that in 1687 there were, out of a population of 6,000, about 1,000 property owners, and that the top 5%, 1% of the population, consisted of 50 rich individuals who had 25% of the wealth. By 1770, the top 1% of property owners owned 44% of the wealth. So the progressive worsening of class disparity by 1770 as compared to... Uh, the beginning of the century. As Boston grew from 1687 to 1770, the percentage of adult males who were poor, perhaps rented a room, or slept in the back of a tavern, owned no property, doubled from 14% of the adult males to 29%, and loss of property meant loss of voting rights. Everywhere the poor were struggling to stay alive, simply to keep from freezing in cold weather, 
All the cities built poor houses in the 1730s, not just for old people, widows, crippled, and orphans, but for unemployed, war veterans, new immigrants. In New York at mid-century, the city almshouse built for 100 poor was housing over 400. A Philadelphia citizen wrote in 1748, quote, it is remarkable what an increase of the number of beggars there is about this town this winter, unquote. In 1757, Boston officials spoke of, quote, a great number of poor who can scarcely procure from day to day daily bread for themselves and families, unquote. Kenneth Lockridge, in a study of colonial New England, found that vagabonds and paupers kept increasing and, quote, the wandering poor, unquote, were a distinct fact of New England life in the middle 1700s. The colonies, it seems, were societies of contending classes, a fact obscured by the emphasis in traditional histories on the external struggle against England, the unity of colonists in the revolution. The country, therefore, was not, quote, born free, unquote, but born slave and free, servant and master, tenant and landlord, poor and rich. Porters in the, in the 1650s in New York refused to carry salt, and carters, truckers, teamsters, carriers, who went on, out on strike were prosecuted in New York City, quote, for not obeying the command and doing their duties as becomes them in their places, unquote. In 1741, bakers combined to refuse to bake because they had to pay such high prices for wheat. A severe f food so shortage in Boston in 1713 brought a warning from town selectmen to the General Assembly of Massachusetts saying the, quote, threatening scarcity of provisions, unquote, had led to such extravagant prices that the necessities of the poor in the approaching winter must needs be very pressing. Andrew uh, Belcher, a wealthy merchant, was exporting grain to the Caribbean because the profit was greater there. On May 19th, 200 people rioted on the Boston Common. They attacked Belcher's ships, broke into his warehouses looking for corn, and shot the lieutenant governor when he tried to interfere. In the 1730s in Boston, people protesting the high prices established by merchants demolished the public market in Dock Square while, as a conservative writer, complained, murmuring against the government and the rich people. In the 1730s, a committee of the Boston Town Meeting spoke out for Bostonians in debt who wanted paper money issued to make it easier to pay off their debts to the merchant elite. They did not want, they declared, to, quote, have our bread and water measured out to us by those who riot in luxury and wantonness on our sweat and toil, unquote. Bostonians rioted also against impressment, in which men were drafted for naval service. They surrounded the house of the governor, beat up the sheriff, locked up a deputy sheriff, and stormed the townhouse where the general court sat. The militia did not respond when called to put them down, and the governor fled. The crowd was condemned by merchant, merchants' group as a, quote, riotous, tumultuous assembly of foreign seamen, servants, negroes, and other persons of mean and vile condition, unquote. So you can see class war starting to be, the, the skeleton of class war starting to form. Through this period, England was fighting a series of wars, Queen Anne's War in the early 1700s, King George's War in the 1730s. Some merchants made fortunes from these wars, but for most people, they meant higher taxes, unemployment, poverty. And an anonymous pamphleteer in Massachusetts writing angrily after King George's War describes the situation. Quote, Poverty and discontent appear in every face, except the countenances of the rich, and dwell upon every tongue, unquote. He spoke of a few men fed by lust of power, lust of fame, lust of money, who got rich during the war. No wonder such men can build ships, houses, buy farms, set up their coaches, chariots, live very splendidly, purchase fame, posts of honor. He called them birds of prey, enemies to all communities wherever they live. The Indians they had found were too unruly to keep as a labor force and remained an obstacle to expansion. Black slaves were easier to control and their profitability for southern plantations was bringing an enormous increase in the importation of slaves who were becoming a majority in some colonies and constituted one-fifth of the entire colonial population. But the, but the blacks were not totally submissive and as their numbers grew, the prospect of slave, slave rebellion grew. With the problem of Indian hostility and the danger of slave revolts, the colonial elite had to consider the class anger of poor whites, servants, tenants, the city poor, the property list, the taxpayer, the soldier, and sailor. As the colonies passed their hundredth year and went into the middle of the 1700s, 
as the gap between rich and poor widened, as violence and the threat of violence increased, the problem of control became more serious. Whites would run off to join Indian tribes or would be captured in battle and brought up among the Indians. And when this happened, the whites, given a chance to leave, chose to stay in the Indian culture. Indians having the choice almost never decided to join the whites. Hector St. John Cravasia, the Frenchman who lived in America for almost 20 years, told in Letters from an American Farmer how children captured during the Seven Years' War and found by their parents, grown up and living with Indians, would refuse to leave their new families. Quote, there must be in their social bond, he said, something singularly captivating and far su superior to anything to be boasted among us. For thousands of Europeans are Indians, and we have no examples of even one of those Aborigines having from choice become Europeans." Unquote. But this affected few people. In general, the Indian was kept at a distance, and the colonial officialdom had found a way of alleviating the danger. By monopolizing, by monopolizing the good land on the eastern seaboard, they forced landless whites to move westward to the frontier, there to encounter the Indians and to be a buffer for the seaboard uh, rich against the tr Indian troubles, while becoming more dependent on the government for protection. Bacon's rebellion was instructive to conciliate a diminishing Indian population at the expense of infuriating a coalition of right white frontiersmen was very risky. Better to make war on the Indian, gain the support of the white, divert possible class conflict by turning poor whites against Indians for security of the elite. In the Carolinas, however, whites were outnumbered by black slaves and nearby Indian tribes. In the 1750s, 25,000 whites faced 40,000 black slaves, with 60,000 Creek, Cherokee, Choctaw, and Chickasaw Indians in the area. Gary Nash writes, quote, Indian uprisings that punctuated the colonial period and a succession of slave uprisings and insurrectionary plots that were nipped in the bud kept South Carolinians sick, uh, sickeningly aware that only through the greatest vigilance and through policies designed to keep their enemies divided could they hope to remain in control of the situation." Unquote. The white rulers of the Carolinas seemed to be conscious of the, the need for a policy, as one of them put it, quote, to make Indians and Negroes a check upon each other, lest by their vastly superior numbers we should be crushed by one or the other. Unquote. And so laws were passed prohibiting free blacks from traveling in Indian country. Treaties with Indian tribes contained clauses requiring the return of fugitive slaves. Blacks ran away to Indian villages, and the Creeks and Cherokees harbored runaway slaves by the hundreds. Many of these were amalgamated into the Indian tribes, married, produced children. But the combination of harsh slave codes and bribes to the Indians to help put down black rebels kept things under control. It was the potential combination of poor whites and blacks that caused the most fear among the wealthy white planters. If there had been the natural racial repugnance that some theorists had, have assumed, control would have been easier, but sexual attraction was powerful across racial lines. Mixed offspring continued to be produced by white-black sex relations throughout the colonial period, in spite of laws prohibiting interracial marriage in Virginia, Massachusetts, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and the Carolinas, Georgia. By declaring the children illegitimate, they would keep them inside the black families so that white so that the white population could remain pure and in control. Parliament in 1770, 1717 made transportation to the New World a legal punishment for crime. After that, tens of thousands of convicts could be sent to Virginia, Maryland, and other colonies. So America becomes like an Australia a prison prison colony. In the 1720s, with fear of slave rebellion growing, white servants were allowed in Virginia to join the militia as substitutes for white freemen. At the same time, slave patrols were established in Virginia to deal with the great dangers that may happen by the insurrection of Negroes. Poor white men would make up the rank and file of these patrols and get the monetary reward. Racism was becoming more and more practical, it seems. As early as 1686, the council in New York ordered that, quote, no Negro or slave be suffered to work on the bridge as a porter about any goods either imported or exported from or into the city." Unquote. In the southern towns, too, white craftsmen and traders were protected from Negro, Negro competition. In 1764, the South Carolina legislature prohibited Charleston masters from employing Negroes or other slaves as mechanics or in handicraft trades. The New Yorker called Waldo Colden in his address to the freeholders in 1747, attacked the wealthy as tax dodgers 
unconcerned with the welfare of others, although he himself was wealthy, and spoke for the honesty and dependability of, quote, the middling rank of mankind, unquote, in whom citizens could best trust our liberty and property, he says. This was to become a critically important rhetorical device for the rule of the few, who would speak of the many of, quote, our liberty, our property, our country. Those upper classes to rule needed to make concessions to the middle class without damage to their own wealth or power at the expense of slaves, Indians, or, and poor whites. This brought loyalty, and to bind that loyalty with something more powerful even than material advantage, the ruling group found in the 1760s and 1770s a wonderfully useful device. That device was the language of liberty and equality, which could unite just enough whites to fight a revolution against England without ending either slavery or inequality. So, kind of a different lens to view the American Revolution. Um, and next is chapter four, Tyranny is Tyranny, about the American Revolution. So, that was chapter three. Thank you very much.